Amen and amen. Thank you so much for that singing and leading us in worship this morning, choir. And thank you again for being patient with us because we're, we're still remodeling. It's not done yet, but we are excited about the end results. And I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We are going to look at verses 1 through 6. And the message today is how to find boldness and courage in troubled times, finding boldness and courage in troubled times. First Thessalonians chapter 2, and I'm going to tell you, you and I need to have boldness and courage in the days that we live in. Do you agree with that, church? Listen, we know that days on this earth are numbered. We know it's going to grow darker. It's going to be more violent. And we know that Jesus is going to return to this earth. And, and when you study the book of Thessalonians, every chapter... Every single chapter makes a reference to either the rapture, the calling away of the church, or the day of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. We learned last week, preparing for eternity now. Now's the time to prepare for eternity. Not after you and I die. That's not the time to prepare for eternity. Do not be under any illusion that you and I are going to be able to sweet talk our way past the judgment of Jesus Christ. Because the moment you die, your eternity is already sealed forever. There are no second chances after death. There is no such thing as reincarnation. There is no get out of hell card free. There is absolutely no such thing as purgatory. There's no way you and I are going to be able to do anything once we take our final breath on this earth. So we need to prepare for eternity now. Now is the day. Today, right now, is when we need to be preparing for eternity. A pastor by the name of Jack Cartwright, he had a lot of nicknames. Some of them I cannot repeat. But during Jack Cartwright's ministry in revivals, it is estimated that maybe 10,000 people came to Christ during the time that he preached. And he was holding a revival meeting, and it was a Monday night. And he had got word that President Andrew Jackson was about to visit the revival service. And his church officials went up to him because he was the guest preacher. And they said, listen, Pastor Cartwright, the president of the United States is going to be at this service today. Do not say anything that would offend him. Do not talk about heaven and hell as you always do. Don't say anything that would be out of line. That night, Pastor Cartwright preached, what does it profit a man if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? And he said, even if the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, who is here tonight, if he dies without Jesus Christ, even Andrew Jackson is going to die and go to hell unless he repents and receives the Lord Jesus Christ. They said at that moment, every church member and every church official dropped their heads in embarrassment. One of the church officials went to President Andrew Jackson at the end of the service and said, we apologize, sometimes he gets carried away. And Andrew Jackson said, every minister ought to love Jesus Christ like Pastor Jack Cartwright. And every minister ought to have the fire of Jack Cartwright. He says, if I had more like them in my army, we would conquer the whole world. And Andrew Jackson was right, because nobody is off limits when it comes to the standards and the righteousness of Almighty God. And we talk about boldness, and we talk about courage. And you know, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. The cemeteries will scream and cry with the dedication of men and women who gave all their lives to die for the freedom of this nation. From the Revolutionary War to the Spanish-American War to World War I to World War II to the Korean War to the Vietnam conflict to Desert Storm to Enduring Freedom, Afghanistan, 
On Normie, do you believe this? 75 years ago, we are celebrating when young men, really what are just babies, what we call them, young men charged in what some have called the mouth of hell on the beaches of Normandy. That was boldness and courage, was it not? They charged through in the cemeteries, scream and cry with their tombstones, saying that's what boldness and courage is all about. And we thank our God for our military. This is why we continue to have the big patriotic service that we do unapologizing that we love our land, we love our flag, we love our officers, we love our military, we love our first responders, we love what they have done for the United States of America. Amen? And it's so critically important to honor them because they had boldness and courage. And yet we see how the world has redefined boldness and courage. It wasn't too many years ago that President Barack Obama handed out awards for courage and valor to those who were fighting the transgender, the homosexuality fight. Well, that's not boldness and courage. That's misguided sin, folks. That's what that is. And, and, you know, this weekend celebrates a bunch of weird people are going to gather or have gathered in Louisiana. And they're celebrating the heroism and the boldness of Bonnie and Clyde. Can you imagine that? The world's obsessed with them. They, they call them boldness. I think they were just nothing but scumbags. They shot officers. They robbed and killed people. But Hollywood and the media and the culture has romanticized Bonnie and Clyde because they stole from the poor. Or they stole from the rich and gave to the poor. They didn't steal from the rich and give to the poor. They gave to themselves. And people honored them and said, but they were true, bold heroes. No, they were thugs and terrorists that got exactly what they deserved. And people say, but you can't say that. I just said it. What are you going to do? What's the worst thing anybody could do to me? What's the worst thing? Kill me? whoop de do? All you're doing is sending me to heaven. And then I'm going to talk about you some more. No, but in heaven. But what's the worst thing you can do? Boldness and courage is what we need. Because the Bible clearly teaches your adversary, the enemy, the devil, is walking about the earth like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? You need boldness and courage. Mount Vernon High School has just been, one spokesperson for the school district said that we made a bold move this past week. We hired Art Browse as our football coach. It's bold. It's not bold, it's stupid. The man covered up rapes. At a college, it has nothing to do with football. It's more reasons to hate Baylor, but it doesn't have anything to do with football. It was a dumb move, but the spokesperson said it was a bold move. Folks, we don't understand what boldness really is all about. When you study the Bible, it tells us what boldness and courage is, and it tells us where to find it. Amen? And this is so critically important. Somebody sent me a video link of a YouTube, and it, how it was just inflammatory of a pastor at Broadway Baptist Church. He closed the graduating ceremonies at Baylor University. And he was saying, Lord, forgive us for running this planet on fossil fuel. And Father, I thank you that I'm not the only straight white man riding, driving the bus anymore. And he talked, and he literally just blasphemed the name of God in this closing prayer. And I thought, and people say, well, that was boldness. No, that was stupidity. Anytime that you blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ, you are stepping out and reaping eternal damnation. The book of Thessalonians, every chapter makes a reference to what? The rapture or the return. And if we properly understand eternity, if we properly understand what's going to happen at judgment day, if we understand that there is a heaven and a hell, all the arguments on abortion, homosexuality, sin, idolatry, paganism, which God is the right God to worship, all that is going to be settled. Did you know that? If you study the Bible, you will find the truth. And, and I'll tell you, there's people that live in sexually promiscuous lifestyles, and they think there is no accountability for that. There are people who are robbing and stealing, and think, there's no accountability. Read the book of First, First Thessalonians. In fact, read Second Thessalonians. It's more blunt and graphic than First Thessalonians. It tells you how to prepare for eternity. Look in your Bibles. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. And I hope you have a bulletin because there's a little bit of a quick outline we're going to follow. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Where do we find boldness and courage? Number one, it's found in the salvation of Jesus Christ. Salvation in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. Verse 2 says, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much affliction or much conflict. My, the really translated on that is much affliction because it was present tense. Paul is describing what happened to them in Acts chapter 14. They were being stoned to death. They were being imprisoned. They were being beaten. It was a harsh treatment. And Paul says, listen, our salvation, and I want you to look in verse 2, it is in God. In verse 1, he says, our coming to you was not in vain. It wasn't empty. It wasn't without purpose. Our salvation is in Christ. What happens when you get saved? You want to know why you can have boldness and courage? What happens when you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior? I know it's a simple message you've heard before. Many things happen the moment you come to know Christ as Savior. But number one, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. Now, folks, that's not just a force. That's not just an influence. That's not a feeling. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. Let me say it again. The moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, takes up residence in your heart. That gives you boldness. That should give you power. Because what happens here, he is saying that even if we were suffered before, we're spitefully treated in verse 2, we were bold in our God, a preposition. Our location, our heart and soul is in Jesus Christ. That's where the boldness comes. What happens when you get saved? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. What else happens? Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and nobody can take that name out of the book of life. Isn't that what the Bible says? What else happens? Your past is wiped away. Your eternity is secure, isn't it? What else happens? That you have a relationship with God that he will not leave you nor forsake you. What else happens? You have the strength and the boldness and the power to stand against Satan and temptation if you choose to tap into the power of God because the Holy Spirit's living inside of you. Look in that Acts chapter 4 verse 13 in the handout. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were what, church? uneducated and untrained men they marveled and they realized though they had been with jesus you see the education had nothing to do with it their social status had nothing to do with it there's a phenomenon that has broken loose in the last 10 years with the increase in social media it's called fomo fear of missing out psychologists counselors are now seeing more and more patients People are saying, I didn't get any likes on my Facebook. They didn't give me any shares. And it's causing people to get stressed out. And there are those who are saying, well, I've got to check my Facebook. I've got to check my uh, this calendar. I've got to check this. I've got to check my Twitter account. I've got to check Instagram. I've got to check Snapchat. I've got to check MySpace. Or, no, they don't even do that anymore. But they've got to check all these things. Oh, no, nobody's contacting me. Nobody's giving me a like. And they have to go get counseling for it. I was on Facebook. I get on my wife's Facebook. But I, was on, I had a Facebook account. I didn't get any likes on what I said. In fact, I got told where I should go. I got told what they thought of me. I didn't go get a counselor. I just kind of laughed. I mean, I hit a nerve, obviously. And Michelle and my son and my daughter and some members of the church said, you really don't need to be on Facebook. It wasn't because I was fear of missing out. It was the fear because I wanted to aggravate people. That's the only reason I wanted a Facebook. And I know there's good ways you should use Facebook. But people get freaked out if they don't get a bunch of likes. Listen, these guys were socially uh, ostracized. And yet they were saying, we saw that they had been with Jesus. Who cares? If you're in Christ, it doesn't matter what the world thinks about you. And so this is where this boldness and this courage is going to come from. Secondly, I want you to see something else. It comes from the Word of God. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, notice he says, But even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. 
For our exhortation, verse 3 says, did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. Pastor Cartwright was mugged several times as a pastor, the one I just told you about. Many times during his revival services, people would charge the pulpit, and they would try to beat him up. He was often penniless. He was hungry at times. He gave a lot of his money to church causes. And they would beat him up. And somebody said, if you would just tone down your preaching, you wouldn't be treated so harshly. And he said, it is not up to me to decide which part of the word of God is acceptable or unacceptable to society. He said, I've been called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so Pastor Cartwright remained beaten down, but his eternal reward is far more greater than the approval of the world. But the word of God gives us boldness. Does it bother you when you hear a preacher say, without Christ you'll die and go to hell? Because it bothers a lot of preachers to preach that. Does it bother you to hear that Jesus is the only way to God, as Brother Larry prayed? Jesus is the only way you can be in a right relationship with God. In fact, does it bother people politically when you say there is no Allah? There, always, there are not many roads to God. There is no such thing as Buddha. There is no such saving power in Muhammad. Does that bother you? Does it scare you? Does it drive people politically you know, insane? Yes, it does, and it should. But here's the bottom line is, because it bothers people doesn't mean we should hold back. Man, as a pastor, I've been confronted with every imaginable, conceivable situation I can think of. I've dealt with people addicted to all kinds of things. I've dealt with the brokenness of relationships due to adultery and fornication. I've had to confront people living in sin. And they say, oh, well, that's not your job. Folks, the Word of God says exactly what is my job. And you say, well, but we shouldn't do that. Well, what are you supposed to do? Turn a blind eye and just let people do what they want to and run the name of Christ and run the name of the church? No, you don't do that. You at least warn them in love, in mercy, in prayer. But you at least warn them. You have a boldness because that's what the Word of God says. I don't have a problem saying Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You know why? Because that's what God's Word says. I don't have a problem preaching that there's a hell because that's what the Bible says. I don't have a problem preaching there's an eternal heaven because that's what the Bible says. I don't have a problem preaching the Word of God. Now, sometimes I get like you. I may get a bad attitude. I may get stressed. But it's still the Word of God, and we should have boldness and courage to deliver the Word of God as is. Think about this. When Jeremiah was called to the ministry, do you remember in Jeremiah chapter 1? Do you remember God tells the prophetic Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I what? I knew who you were. Before you were ever formed in the womb, before you were ever even at the moment of conception, I knew who you were. That's an amazing testimony to the knowledge of our God, isn't it? That's why you can't run from God, hide from God, con God, or ignore God. Because He knows who you are before you ever put on this earth. He knows where you're going even today. But you remember He called Jeremiah the prophetic ministry. And Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord, I cannot speak, for I am a what? A child. God says, don't worry, I'll touch your mouth. I'll tell you what to speak. You remember when he sent the disciples out two by two? He says, don't worry about taking possessions. Don't worry about anything that you're doing. I got this. They're going to deliver you up to the councils, and you're going to be scourged, and you're going to be beaten, and you're going to be in prison. But don't worry, I'll tell you exactly what to say. Do you remember in Exodus 3, God told Moses, you go to Pharaoh, and you tell him to let my people go. And Moses said, who should I say sent me? And God tells Moses, you tell him, I am sent you. And then in Exodus chapter 4, Moses says, what should I say? And God says, I will tell you what to say when the time comes. This is the word of God. This is why Christians, or at least those who are proclaiming Christ, aren't living for Christ. They don't even know what the Bible says. Or if they do know what the Bible says, they try to change it. Listen. That pastor at Broadway Baptist Church, it's not that Broadway's ever been a conservative church and there's many more like them. Folks, but I'm going to say it again. We do not have the right as any religious denomination or believers to alter or tamper with the Holy Word of God. The boldness that is in God's Word is going to be there for all eternity. Number three, 
pure motives. Look at the pure motives. Notice in verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians 2. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And, and so the pure motives have to be paramount to anything we do in ministry. Now, whenever I think about the rapture, I get excited. Whenever I think about any moment that Jesus could call us off this earth as true believers, that's pretty exciting. It's a signless event. The rapture is, is without evidence. There's no other things that have to happen for Jesus to call his church away. I get excited, but I also get sad because I know a lot of loved ones are going to be left behind. When I think about seeing Jesus face to face, that's pretty overwhelming, isn't it? When I think about standing before a holy God, does that not as a believer somewhat excite you? It should be overwhelming. It should be kind of scary in some sense. Because are you ready to stand before him? That's the question you ask. But standing face to face with a holy God. In the last 48 hours, I've seen things and been places that I didn't know existed. I thought, that's pretty amazing. I, I stood right there because of, I was there. I might as well saw it. I saw, some of you folks aren't going to like this, I saw the University of Alabama Stadium. It's like walking into trophy heaven. They've won so many championships. Don't, don't turn me off here if you're Sooners or Aggies. Just hold on because they beat Texas too. But it's overwhelming to see the legendary status of the University of Alabama. But it's just earthly trophies. It doesn't mean anything. But when you stand before a holy God, there are no trophies. It's just you and millions of, un, millions of uncounted believers standing before a holy God who created the heavens and the earth, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. Now, now folks, our motives on this earth need to be pure. The rapture, the return of the Lord should motivate us that whatever we do should be all for the glory of God. Amen? And this is why I don't understand people living in wanton, open rebellion against God. Need to have pure motives. Paul says this in verse 4. We are entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And he says, we've been approved by God, verse 4. Do you all see that? We have been approved. We've been tested by God. God knows our hearts. That's the amazing thing about the, the, the knowledge of God. He knows who we are. He knows what we're thinking. And then he says, we are to please men. We have a desire to please God and not people. You want to know where boldness and courage? Don't worry about what men think. He says in verse 4, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For verse 5 says, for neither at any time, watch this, neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor our cloak for covetousness. God is witness. God is witness. Now, now, notice he says in verse 6, we did not seek glory from men. And we'll discuss that here in just a moment. But we didn't seek glory from men or from you or from others. And we didn't make demands even though we were the authoritative apostles of Christ. Now, here's why I want to bring this home this morning. Because there are too many people that are worried about pleasing men. And, and I want to say this. Every time I've ever had a revivalist or an evangelist, every church I've ever pastored, if you hear, the, hear anything, hear this. I've been told too many years, I heard it in Bible college, that an evangelist or a guest speaker can say things that the pastor cannot say. You ever heard that? That they should be able to say things that the pastor cannot say. There's something wrong with that theology. Because if it's in the Word of God, you should be able to say it. And if it's in the Word of God, you should be able to preach it. It doesn't matter whether you're going to get a paycheck or not. It doesn't matter what the people think. And we have been handcuffed and restricted for years in the pulpits and in the pews and in the public light by political correctness. You can't say this and you can't say that. That is so hypocritical and so backwards. If it's in the Word of God, you should be able to say it and you can't worry about pleasing people because you're not going to stand before a person. That's why I don't understand with all this garbage going on in our world today all this arguing and debating i went through three st states went to alabama mississippi and louisiana and they're all fighting this abortion thing hallelujah they're fighting they're following along with other states 
They're, they're standing up, and I realize there's arguments on both sides, but I know where I stand, and I'm standing on the side of Jesus Christ, pro-life, all the way. But, but here's the thing. They're arguing about it. And people are saying, well, you know what? One Hollywood star is saying, we need to boycott Georgia. We not need to make films there anymore. Go ahead. Another one says that, you know, we need, the women need to withhold sex from their husbands. That's stupid logic. Another one says, well, if you vote for pro-life, we're going to make sure you get voted out. Listen, if you're a Christian when you get voted into office, you darn well ought to be a Christian when you get out of office. And you ought to act like a Christian while you're in office. Amen? And, and you ought to represent Jesus Christ even when other people are not looking. Not to please people. And this is why he says in verse 6, We didn't seek glory from men. We sought glory for the Lord Jesus Christ. Boldness and courage that whatever I preach, whatever I sing, however I drive, whoever I speak to, Whatever I do in my private business, whatever I do in my private life, I want to bring honor and attention to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 6, that we do not make demands as apostles of Christ. Now when Paul says this in verse 6, you do not see that there's a logical connection to prayer. But prayer is the last point. How are we going to have boldness how are we going to find it? You're going to find it through prayer. But I want you to see, though, he says, we do not de make, make demands as apostles of Christ. Let me tell you why that's connected to prayer. Paul says, just because we have a title doesn't mean we are going to circumvent or shortchange the system of holiness and righteousness. Because he said, the power for us to preach comes from the Holy Spirit. The power for us to preach comes from prayer. Look in your handout and look at Acts 4, 29 through 31. You want prayer and boldness? Or you want boldness and courage? You need to learn how to pray. Watch this in Acts 4, 29 through 31. Now, Lord, look on their threats. Now, you see that? They're under persecution. Y'all see that? Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness, which means free speech, that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with what? Boldness. Because they prayed. And again, God's timing is everything. You don't have to be like the barber who just got saved at a Baptist church and he signed up for a soul winning class. And he went through six weeks of training, evangelism explosion. Y'all remember that? It's the Roman road. It's two questions. If you were to die today, do you know for certain you'd go to heaven? And if you were to die today and stand before God, and he was to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? Those are questions that God will not ask because he already knows. But they're diagnostic questions in order to introduce a conversation. And this barber was so excited. And he was an old-fashioned barber. I mean, he had one of those long razors. Y'all have seen those, haven't you? He still had the old barber pole outside of his barber shop. And his first customer, he was so excited to share the gospel, he couldn't wait. He, he waited. He opened up. He said, hey, come on in. And he started thinking, what are those questions? If you were to die, to, no, wait, what is the question? And so he put that razor into that guy's neck. He says, are you prepared to die today? And the man said, I'll give you whatever you want. Just let me live. He kind of got a little over-enthusiastic. And the, the, guy took the, the barber took the razor from him and said, I'm sorry. I was just going to tell you about Jesus. He said, I'll, I'll say whatever you want to say. Just let me out of here. Now listen. Our boldness has to come from prayer. And it has to come from the right motives. In 2 Timothy 1.7, the Bible says Paul... Did not, or the, the Bible says, Paul says to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity or weakness, but he gave us a power of sound mind and boldness. He didn't give that to us. When we're scared, it's not coming from God. And I know it's hard to witness to other people, and it's hard to declare, hey, I'm going to start living right, especially in the midst of peer pressure, in the midst of all the things that we have to deal with. Folks, there are people men and women who are putting on uniforms every single day that put their life on the line. Did you know that? 
And they, do you know that? Because see, boldness is designed as the ability to speak or act freely despite perceived threats or potential threats or risk. It's the ability to speak or act freely despite the risk or potential risk or danger. And there are people who put their uniforms on. Those are the heroes. It's not the Bonnie and Clydes. It's not the guys that can dunk basketballs. And it takes a lot of boldness and courage to say, I want to live for Jesus Christ. I don't care what my friends do, what my friends say. Man, my wife's had boldness for years. She will stand up in her integrity. She can look herself in the mirror at night, despite what people say about her. She'll walk away from a situation, but she will hold her head up with integrity. I've watched her witness to a mother, a stepmother who abused her, who physically abused her. And she, with boldness and integrity, spoke the words of life. I've seen her in recent months take a beating on her reputation. But she lays her head down at night and says, My boldness and my integrity is far more important than pleasing people. Amen. Now I say my wife because really my wife in a lot of ways is my hero. Because I've seen her overcome a whole lot more than I have. I've had to overcome stupidity. She's had to overcome obstacles from a very early age. But she's got, she, she can say, I can stand in my integrity. Can you say that? Can you say, I have the boldness and the courage to stand before a holy God and say, I declare that I'm a Christian and I want to start acting like it. I want to start living like it. I don't care what other people are saying to me or saying about me. I want to live for Jesus Christ. And that means maybe telling some adults in your life, hey, I'm not partying with you anymore. Young people telling some others, I'm not going to keep sleeping around. I'm not going to keep doing what you're doing. It takes boldness and courage, but it's simple to do because that's what the Bible says. How many people would be alive today if they just would have had the boldness and the courage to say, I will not use that meth. I will not smoke that dope. I will not sleep with you. I will not do these things. But we think the sexual revolution, that's what we should be all about in this country. It's all about sex, sex, sex. It's all about power and status. And I've got to get likes on Facebook. I came to a conclusion a long time ago as a sports writer, I just couldn't care less what people thought of me. Because if I did, I would be always trying to please people. I wrote articles that would make coaches mad. Man, I'd write articles that make parents mad. Well, your kid fumbled seven times. That's not my fault. He has your name. And one parent said, well, did you have to use his name? He fumbled seven times. I'm sorry. I, I wasn't putting him down. He, j he just fumbled seven times. One team got beat 72 to 15. That's really not a close game, is it? And I wrote the headline, Farmers Steamroll Lions. Lady called up. You didn't have to say steamrolled. Well, what was I going to say? Farmers squeaked by the lions. It was 65 nothing at halftime. It wasn't close. And people say, well, this is how I want to spin it. This is how I want it. It doesn't matter how you want to spin it or view it. It matters what God says. You need to, and I need boldness and courage. And we need to do it with motivations that are pleasing to the Lord. I don't tell people they're going to hell because I enjoy it. I will preach the gospel because that's what God's commanded me to do. And I hate for people to leave this earth without having all the available information. They need to make an informed decision. And I don't care about who it makes mad. I'm not trying to make people mad. I'm not trying to hurt feelings. But if it hurts your feelings, it's going to hurt a whole lot worse in eternity. Amen? And even where you're sitting this morning in these pews, you're sitting home at Facebook, and you're listening, you need boldness and courage. You're going to have to, first of all, ask Jesus Christ into your hot life if you've never done that. Because that's where the boldness starts. The Holy Spirit will supernaturally live in your life. You're going to have to get into the Word of God. You're going to have to realize, I can't please people. I've heard, and I've seen it too many times in the ministry, I'm closing with this. When teenagers have come to know Christ, or a spouse has come to know Christ. I've seen it more when a lady will come to know Christ, and the physical threats that the spouse will inflict upon that spouse, or parents who will tell their children, 
don't you dare go to that church again. I was a youth minister, and I shared with a, a mother and a dad, hey, your 16-year-old accepted Christ as Savior. Could I share with you? She looked at me and said, what are you, some kind of a pervert teaching him all this blank, blank, expletive stuff that she started mouthing off? She said, if you dare mention Jesus to him, I will never let him come back to this church. I said, we're going to mention Jesus. We're going to mention him every day. And we're going to teach him Jesus. And you know, nothing good happened to that family after that. The boys remained faithful. And they came in spite of their parents' objections. But nothing good came of those parents. One disaster after another. How dare anyone say, I will stand in the way of a holy God. So wherever you're at today, you need to declare right now. I want boldness and courage, but I want to do it God's way. Because you're going to need it in this world. Things are going to get a lot more difficult than they are right now. Would you stand with me as heads are bowed and eyes closed? Our Father, as we come to you in Jesus' name, I pray that we would have the boldness and the courage to turn from a wicked lifestyle, to declare our salvation before you, to receive you as Savior, to publicly confess our need for you, to make decisions on our knees today that are so desperately needed in times of uncertainty and violence and darkness and deception by Satan. Oh Lord, stir our hearts today that we would be able to see and depend completely upon you for everything in this world so that our boldness and courage would come from heaven and not from the hopes of this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. It's a hymn of invitation is sung as we go into this time. You may need to come today. Please don't worry about all these microphones and these cameras. They're not going to affect you. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you need to do that today. It takes boldness and it takes courage. But I want to be honest with you, it takes a lot of ignorance for you to remain where you're at today. Because you will die and you will go to hell without Jesus. If you're a Christian, you know the Lord is Savior, but your boldness and courage for Him has waned. It is dying out. You need to recommit your life to Him. Recommit your prayer life to Him. Your hunger for the Word of God. Because that's where your boldness is going to come from. Brother Randall sings, you come and I'll meet you right here at the front.